Art of War comes up with the formula of combined arms synthesis that's basically um, was in keeping with the times and, um, uh, and, and really did provide guidance for the next couple hundred years to all sorts of uh, people from Gustavus Adolphus to Maurice of Nassau and others um, for, for how to operate at that level. <laughs> Welcome to Shield of the Republic, a podcast sponsored by the Bulwark and the Miller Center of Public Affairs, and dedicated to the proposition articulated by Walter Lippmann during World War II that a strong and balanced foreign policy is the necessary shield of our democratic republic. I'm Eric Edelman, counselor at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, a non-resident fellow at the Miller Center and a Bulwark contributor, my normal partner in all things strategery, uh, Elliot Cohen, uh, the uh, Robert E. Osgood, uh, Professor of Strategy at Johns Hopkins School of Advanced International Studies and the Arlie Burke Chair of Strategy at the Center for Strategic and International Studies is on a well-deserved vacation. But I'm joined today uh, by our special guest, uh, Professor Christopher Lynch, who is the Chair of the Political Science Department at Missouri State University, uh, also the translator and editor of the most recent edition of Machiavelli's The Art of War, and the author of a recent book, Machiavelli on War, published by Cornell University Press. Welcome, Chris. Thanks. Thanks for having me. Thrilled to be here. So um, this is uh, not our normal fare on Shield of the Republic. We, we don't normally devote ourselves to uh, you know the, the classics, although we probably should. And uh, I'm thrilled to be able to have this conversation with you, Chris, because the book is really Terrific. I, I hadn't read a book on Machiavelli, I think, since Harry Harvey Mansfield's uh, Machiavelli's Virtue, uh, which I probably read about 20 years ago. So this was a wonderful opportunity to uh, dig back into a, a thinker who I always find uh, it fun to tangle with. I wonder if you might start by uh, talking a little bit about Machiavelli as both a statesman and a political philosopher, because he was... Uh, not just a cloistered, you know, academician, you know, philosophizing in an ivory tower. This was someone who had a pretty serious career in government with major diplomatic missions, uh, you know, major military campaign, uh, un, you know, to his to his credit, including ultimately the reconquest of Pisa, the one of uh, Florence's uh, possessions uh, during the Renaissance. Um, but then he goes off and, and writes some of the most penetrating and important uh, uh, works of political philosophy uh, that you know essentially s set the stage for the arrival of modernity, as it were. So talk a little bit about Machiavelli, the statesman, as, as, as he grows into Machiavelli, the political philosopher. Sure. Uh, yeah, it's uh, it's it's so important to see those two sides. And he himself, in his two comprehensive works, The Prince, that you know most listeners would be familiar with, and, and the Discourses on Livy, his book on republics, um, he makes very clear that those two sources of knowledge, on the one hand, um, his own experience with modern things. Um, which, you know, means him living in the modern world in general, but specifically his experience in government, combined with his reading of ancient things, these two things, this practical contemporary and this theoretical historical, you need them both to, to really get at what he is most uh, interested in and to his thought as a whole. So, um, so you know, he himself underlines the importance of of his own his own experience, um, much of the you know scholarship about Machiavelli up until about fifteen years ago, twenty years ago, really uh, made a not accurate case um, of him as sort of an at best armchair general, as someone who sat back, didn't have any real involvement in political military affairs, and was also enamored of the ancient Romans and his love for them blinded him to the realities of his day. There's all sorts of stuff that it, I, I thought 
was probably accurate when I started studying Machiavelli decades ago. I was just interested in for his political philosophy and took for granted what these uh, military historians were saying. But as I got into it, I realized, uh, no, he had deep, long, hard experience um, of military matters, first of all, as a bureaucrat in Florence. But then as time went on, uh, as you alluded to, you know, he found himself first negotiating with with Florence's mercenary captains and allies and, and others. But then as time went on, he recognized and finally persuaded the Florentine authorities, we need our own fighting force. And so he did what he could to develop that, passing the law to make it happen, doing the recruitment. And, and then uh, eventually in 1509, leading the, the finally successful after many years of trying to bring Pisa, a once subject city, back under Florentine control, um, he led the successful investment of and conquest of the city. Um, it's not, I mean, it's important to recognize he did not lead you know, a huge army in open field battle, and he doesn't pretend to, and I don't pretend he did. But he, you know, he led thousands of troops in um, in a complex, long, uh, months long uh, investment of of a city and preparing to siege the city when it collapsed and engaged in all the negotiations with the with the you know people within Pisa um, for the surrender. Uh, so you know, he was he was right in the thick of it. And um, at, at all levels, you know, recruitment, training, leading. Um, and that's just Pisa. I mean, there were plenty of other other instances. Um, so, yeah, it was it was really extensive. And um, why I thought it was kind of important to get to the bottom of whether he was any good at this military stuff is because it, it's hard to know how to assess what he's written with this cloud of you know, how, how, how to know how to assess what he's written on the big questions when the rumor is on the little questions he was out to lunch. Um, you know, I, I didn't know how to, to negotiate that. So I tried to get to the bottom of it and I found, you no, know, he really knew what was going on and had very good judgment on, on these tactical, uh, logistical and other matters. So, um, so yeah, I think it's, it's crucial to, to see that, um, in order to know how to approach the other stuff. He also had some serious uh, uh, diplomatic experience. I mean, he's sent on missions to the court of the French king, who is a major player in the uh, external intervention in, in Italian politics during the early modern era, and uh, to the papacy, which of course was a huge, uh, not just spiritual power uh, against which uh, Machiavelli has a lot of gripes, but also, um, it was a temporal power uh, as well in, in Italian politics. So he was not without diplomatic experience either. So with both the political and military uh, that he brought together in his career. Absolutely. I mean, it, it, it's really important to see that um, because he, he has sort of the military details and the political context within which they're going on through his experience and through his study. I mean, I start, start the book uh, with a chapter that um, you know sort of recounts the a, a chronicle that he wrote, um, you know, long couple long poems, um, where he lays out the the sort of milit political context of the military stuff that he was so engaged in, and he knew it both from study of of you know the writings of the day, but as you suggest, through direct experience with the big actors inside and outside of Italy, long experience. I mean, he was at the court of France for six months, um, with Cesare Borgia for four months, with the Pope for over a month, and um, you know, and talking to these folks. You know, he was talking one to one with Cesare Borgia. He was um, you know met with the French King and you know did most of his dealings with the with uh, one of his right hand men, but but sometimes with the king himself. So yeah, he was uh, he wasn't you know a head of state by any stretch. Um, you know he wasn't even uh, you know the elected official within Florence. He was barred from that, but he was a bureaucrat who ended up you know operating uh, within the highest spheres you could really be in. 
as a as a denizen of the deep state myself, I'm 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 quite yeah. uh, quite sympathetic to to that part of Machiavelli's career and envious in some ways. Um, yeah, no, I had a brief I had a brief and at a much lower level um, uh, stint in the deep state myself, the State Department. So I I know what you're talking about. Um, I, I'd like to just talk a little bit about the art of war because you have. Uh, uh, edited and uh, translated it from the Italian and um, with a long introductory essay, part of which is, is kind of repurposed in the book. Um, I, you know, I have to say when I, when I read your translation, um, you know, I, I would say it was a little bit tough going. I mean, there's an awful lot in there about, you know, the, you know, proper way to, you know, situate and uh, put your fortifications and build them and, a lot about uh, order and discipline of troops, et cetera. Yet, you know, Clausewitz uh, says Machiavelli's judgment on all matters of war is pretty accurate. And you make the case in the book that Machiavelli is not just, uh, you know, writing a treatise on war. He really is, uh, in some sense, the father uh, of modern grand, grand strategy. Could you s sketch out that case a little bit? Sure, yeah. Um you know, I mean, it is he, Machiavelli as grand strategist um, and, you know, sort of self-conscious thinker about grand strategy really doesn't come into view uh, until you open up his discourses on Livy. But, um, you know, and, and, and there it's he, he looks at Rome. He takes his version of Rome. He kind of invents, a, <laughs> he uses the historical record, but he doctors it when he needs to to fit his his view of grand strategy, um, you know, you need to look there, but in the art of war itself, um, you know, it, he does think through the relationship between the political and, uh, you know, sort of authorities and the military authorities, even as he's, and that really has kind of a problem, a kind of perennial tension within the political world that he really brings out fully when he gets later to the prince. But um, with the, I mean, he wrote The Art of War later, but, um, uh, you know, he, he, he brings it out fully in, in, in The Prince, um, which isn't published until after The Art of War. But, um, yeah, in, in The Art of War itself, uh, he, he does consider the different types of command. Um, and, uh, you know, you, you get a hint of what he then in the discourses, uh, you know, really develops both in terms of grand strategy and in terms of command, um, how to command at the operational sort of high operational level. You get that view in the art of war, but you do spend most of the time trying to figure out how to combine the different arms within the military at the time in a way that is going to be most effective. All of all of Europe at that time was kind of groping towards trying to figure out, you know, how do we put together the artillery that has shown itself to be very effective when it comes to sieges, but not so effective when it comes to battlefield war. How do you put that together with cavalry, which has been the dominant force for the last hundred years under mercenary captains who used, used the cavalry as their main arm with infantry, which had been shown to be very effective in the Swiss pikemen. Um, how do you put these all together? Everyone was groping for how to do it. The art of war comes up with the formula of combined arms synthesis that's basically um, was in keeping with the times and, um, uh, and, and really did provide guidance for the next couple hundred years to all sorts of uh, people from Gustavus Adolphus to Maurice of Nassau and, and others. Um, for for how to operate at that level you know the uh, point you made earlier i think is worth uh, spending some time on which is uh you make the point that to get it machiavelli as grand strategist you really have to look not just at the art of war but at the full corpus of his writings. And uh, that's a very a big theme of, of your book, which is you've got to look at all of this. But, but moreover, that um, warfare, uh, both initiating it, ending it, um, waging it, um, 
is a you know major leitmotif through all the works and you know both the art of war which was published in his lifetime and then the posthumously published works the discourses on livy the the prince uh etc um so talk a little bit about how all of this manifests itself through the entire corpus of his writings and and is there anything to the fact that the major writings were published after his death is there something that you know we should understand about that to, as a key to this as well yeah sure um maybe I'll, I'll start with that last point first um to just get our bearings among his different works um yeah he his his works that he uh you know in which he wrote as he himself says everything he knows his comprehensive works are the very short prints which puts forward what you know everything he knows but you know uh from the perspective of and under the literary conceit of a job application to a prince um and his discourses on Livy, which presents itself as a commentary on uh, the history of Titus Livius, this great Roman historian of mainly the uh, Republican period of Rome. Um, so uh, those are his two comprehensive works. Those are the works that he's becomes famous, most famous for subsequently. They're the ones that he arranges to have circulated during his lifetime, but not published in part because they are so um, incendiary, morally speaking. Um, and uh, uh, he really does in them for people who are alert to this uh, attack, the papacy, not just the papacy, Christianity itself, uh, not just Christianity itself, but the entire Western tradition and you know sort of sets himself up as this as, as someone who really wants to set you know the western world and maybe humanity as such on a new path it's very big ambitious um and dangerous stuff and uh he knew that to, to publish this in his lifetime would be a problem so uh the more staid art of war where he doesn't let the lid off of all this stuff he publishes during his lifetime one of the, the chronicles I mentioned he published during his lifetime. Um, so uh, so that's a big difference among these works. But once you do get to the to the comprehensive works, and especially the discourses when it comes to grand strategy, um, he does, as I mentioned, take take the Roman Republic as his ostensible model. Um, it's because he takes it as his ostensible model many historians have mistaken like i suggested earlier a sort of him for having a slavish adherence to whatever rome did but if you pay attention he messes with the history when it doesn't suit his overall um his thoughts about about strategy and command um which makes you realize mm, he's he's got his own vision and he's using livy and he's using rome as really a conduit for conveying his overall strategic thought. Now, he doesn't have a, a, a prescription for what what the grand strategy that everyone must have, you know, is. And anyone who who's thought much about politics realizes there can't be a, a general prescription. It depends. Um, it depends on your circumstances. It depends. Are you a republic? Are you a principality? Are you big? Are you small? Um, uh, you know, all all sorts of things. Uh, so he takes um, a couple different uh, scenarios and takes expansion. He takes Roman expansionism as the thing that Rome was compelled to do and which you, if you're a republic, ought to recognize you need to do because if you don't do it first, someone's going to do it to you. So expand, take over, structure yourself so, such that you're able to do that. The core of that is having a large, powerful military, which is going to allow you to uh, win in open field battles. Best case, be able to, to, to win against any other uh, going competitor in open field battles so that you can prevail in any war. Allowing you to have the kind of reputation that then allows you to get all sorts of capitulation from others near and far based on your reputation. Um, 
and then I won't get into details on this too much because it gets a little arcane, but um, developing a, a system of colonies and alliances, um, which enable you to continue your expansion. All that said, that's just one paradigm he puts forward. He's got another one of, well, there's some disadvantages to that. So you could have a league of smaller republics. And in that case, it's limited expansion. And you yourself become the mercenaries that you should avoid using <laughs> if you're doing plan one. Plan two is, well, be a strong, small republic. Hire your, mer hire your soldiers out as mercenaries and maintain a kind of a, a robust alliance structure. National monarchy of a prince is yet another example. So he, he, go, he considers different grand strategies and thinks them through and then offers the uh, sort of operational advice as to how to bring those about, um, depending on the circumstances. What's lurking behind all of this, I mean, I, correct me if, if I'm wrong, but is uh, his preoccupation with the weakness of the Italian city-states in contrast yep. to the grandeur of Rome. Um, yep. And uh, basically, there's a kind of... Uh, I mean, I, I would call it a restorationist impulse that he has, which is how to make Italy great again, to coin a phrase. Um, yeah, the same. <laughs> um, and uh, uh, deal with the infirmities that the city-states have vis-a-vis -vis the great powers of the time, the Holy Roman Empire to the north, the French, the Kingdom of France uh, to the northeast, and, and the papacy to the south, which is, I mean, his, uh, you know, uh, uh, animus towards the papacy is driven a lot by the fact that the papacy is in frequently bringing in these other players in order to, to to serve its own purposes temporally in Italy, but which is weakening Italy against other great powers. I mean, so that, I mean, that uh, seems to be a big driver of, of his of his thinking. Absolutely. I mean, that's it's it organizes certainly his presentation of his of his thought, and I think much of the thought itself. I don't think he's sort of uh, you know, like traumatized or unable to think outside the the situation of Italy, but um, it definitely is the the situation he's dealing with, and it and it does help in in reading Machiavelli to just keep in mind what you sort of outlined, which is that there are three major outside powers, right? France, Spain, and the Holy Roman Emperor. And there are five major inside powers uh, inside Italy, you know, sort of going around the clock, Milan, Venice, Florence, the papacy, and uh, Naples, um, or the kingdom of the two Sicilies. So, um, so these uh, are in a complex dynamic relationship with one another but in his diagnosis of the the sickness of italy you identify the the key thing and that is um the the papacy and its uh constitutional inability with one kind of exception under julius ii the warrior pope <laughs> its constitutional inability to really have its own arms as a spiritual power, it needs to maintain its its um, status as spiritual, not, uh, not physical, and therefore doesn't have a military. So it needs to facilitate the already existing, uh, quite corrupt in many ways, mercenary system. It needs to hire troops, or it needs to bring in outside powers and it can do that. It's powerful enough through its spiritual power to succeed at, at, at um, uh, hiring those troops because it's got a lot of money uh, and it's got enough authority to bring in outside troops, but it doesn't have enough to really command the situation. So it's just this perfectly, <laughs> it's this thorn in the side of, of Italy and Machiavelli's, you know, admittedly exaggerated interpretation. He knows he's exaggerating the you know, role of the papacy. Um, but uh, the result is that um, that throughout Italy, and especially in Florence, they have become consumed by this mercenary system and this reliance on outside powers. Florence is reliant on 
its French patron to protect it on the one hand. And when it doesn't have France or in conjunction with uh, French troops, it has to hire outside troops. And this just makes for a disastrous, uh, you know, uh, military and diplomatic uh, position. And it's that that Machiavelli says must happen. And it's a phrase he learned from Cesare Borgia, one's own arms. Um, in his in his mission, first long mission to Cesare, Cesare just said, you guys cannot be taken seriously because you don't have your own arms. And Machiavelli brings that message back and says, we need to have our own arms. Um, and, and he develops that. So, so yeah, the, the sickness of these Greek city-states is profound. Machiavelli sees that as the first thing that needs to be solved. It can't ultimately, it can't, you know, in the biggest sense be solved until not just the papacy loses its power, but Christianity itself becomes less, uh, has less of a hold on the world, um, which is what he ultimately aims at. But, uh, but in the shorter term, yeah, he needs to, you need to get arms of your own to get out of that, that mercenary system. Yeah, I, I want to uh, pull the thread a little bit on on uh, the arms of one's own, because you mm -hmm. make the you make the argument that this is not just uh, a case of um, Machiavelli saying you know you, you have to have arms of your own in the sense of uh, Florence has to have its own militia, which he he writes the mm -hmm. ordinance for to uh, create the militia. He trains it, he drills it, etc. But he also sees this as a kind of philosophical. Uh, issue as well that yeah. uh, to, and to have one's own arms philosophically is to have the understanding of the world as it is as opposed to uh, the, the world uh, that you know ideally people might want it to be uh, and to um, understand both military and political necessity as you were suggesting earlier and being able to wield them together uh, you know, as a, as a matter of, of statecraft. Um, yeah. Could you talk about, about that a little bit, the sort of spiritual arms, uh, that, of oneself that he's talking about the being the knower, knower of things as, as you put mm -hmm. it. Yeah. You know, it's funny that, that being a knower of things is really the, the, the linchpin of his thought. And it actually connects the two things that, that we've been talking about and that you're pushing me to the other of the two things. That is him as a, a practitioner and analyst of, of his time uh, on the one hand and, and someone who's giving you know advice to actual commanders uh, on the one hand and then him as a political philosopher on the other. Uh, it's the linchpin of both because you know even sticking for another second with the with the you know sort of literal, military side of things, the thing he most wants to cultivate in commanders is the ability to think on their own and to think, uh, you know, nimbly, deeply and effectively and not to rely on received opinion, not to rely on doctrine, um, but to have, you know, in the expressions we would use, uh, a, a kind of situational awareness that is really thoroughgoing, um, such that you know, he's, uh, commander is always thinking um, about his situation on a bunch of different registers that Machiavelli lays out. So that on the military side, but then you're right. I mean, uh, what this really is kind of symbolic of and representative of when you get to his philosophic side is having one's own arms means being able to think for yourself about the very nature of things and not rely on any outside authority, especially religious authority, but really any, uh, you know, other authority that it, it's kind of like, you could almost think of it if, if, um, you know, for those familiar with as you know, most people are, I think of, uh, Rene Descartes, I think therefore I am and his, you know, sort of doubting away all of existence. Machiavelli doesn't do that, but Descartes doubts away all of existence so that he can, you know, be sure of one thing. Well, I exist, and um, then I'll build a theory of knowledge based on that one certainty. Machiavelli's not developing that kind of epistemology, but politically, morally, he's saying you must rely on yourself, and primarily yourself as a thinker who knows, uh, you know, needs to know um, the the nature of reality uh, as it is, and part of that 
uh, yes, it, it means knowing uh, reality and being a realist and not buying into a bunch of, uh, you know, happy tales about how things ought to be. But, but it's, it's, he's, he's acutely aware of and familiar with those, what he calls imaginary republics and principalities, what Plato put forward, what Aristotle put forward, what St. Augustine put forward, these different models of rule. He, he knows about these and he's, um, arguing against them, but not in kind of a breezy, oh, they're just a bunch of silly guys, but with full awareness that they are putting forward or they put forward an understanding of politics and even of war, especially his beloved Xenophon, that's his favorite classical author. Um, they put forward an understanding of, of politics and war um, that has great purchase that he sees the benefit of, but that aided and abetted and led to what, from Machiavelli's point of view, is this great disaster of Christianity really ruling the world and taking our eyes off the ball of um, life as it's really lived. And he's really trying to kind of wrench the attention of the world back to the nature of the world itself and kind of away from uh, the Christian dispensation and then the whole tradition that, that props it up for as much as he he has tons of sympathy with the ancient Greek and, and Roman writers and thinkers. I mean, yes. I mean, it's a um, perhaps most powerfully argued case against the conventional wisdom. And I think, uh, you know, one can find, particularly in matters military and, and uh, diplomatic, um, which may be one reason why I find it uh, so attractive. I, I wonder, um, you know, I don't know if you've read it, but Matt, Kronig um, has an essay on Machiavelli in the new. Uh, yeah, I, I saw it. It looked really good to me. I didn't. I, I looked at it. I, I didn't even know there was a new edition of, of the, New Makers of uh, Modern Strategy. Yeah, and then I, I saw it. It looked really solid to me. Yeah, it, it's interesting though. I wonder if you'd comment on one element of that, Matt. Uh, Matt, um, who had written himself on um, the. Um, contemporary great power competition between uh, uh, authoritarian and um, uh, and democratic regimes uh, sort of sees Machiavelli as a precursor in a sense, you know, uh, because uh, he lays a lot of emphasis, as as do you, on Machiavelli's writing in the discourses, which is, uh, you know, his major work on republics as opposed to uh, principalities. Although, Machiavelli refers to even the leaders of republics as as princes and, and leaders. So I wonder if you if you I mean is that too presentist a reading uh, of Machiavelli to see him as some in some sense a precursor of the argument about uh, the strengths and weaknesses of democracies versus authoritarian regimes? Oh no, I think it's not at all too presentist. It's 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 really an absolutely key. Uh, key distinction for him, the difference between a principality, which we would think of as an authoritarian regime, and his version, his best version of a principality is that it's very, it's very authoritarian. And its control of the military is absolutely essential to um, an ex a successful, what we call authoritarian, he calls it a uh, principality um, regime. So, uh, on the one hand, and then on the other, Republic. These are the two, these these two books. It's no coincidence that he wrote two books in which it's everything he knows, he says in each one. Um, one's a tiny little book for a busy prince, but everything he knows is there. <laughs> one's a big, long, sprawling book, uh, commentary on a you know, history of a Republic. It's on Republics. Um, so, no, I, th I think he's, he uh, is uh, someone who would help us very much now in, you know, facing a, a world where, you know, again, we have, as in the Cold War, authoritarian regimes sort of lining up and some uh, regimes that are democratic lining up together and figuring out how this is going to cash out in a much less ideologically charged environment, right? I mean, it, it's, it's as things are starting to line up now, you have a network of authoritarian regimes, some religious, some not, um, and a network of, you know, once closely united uh, liberal democracies. 
um, which are like the republics Machiavelli talks about, not identical to by any stretch. You know, so one has to keep in mind the distinction between a liberal democracy and the kind of republic that he puts forward. But still, in broad terms, I think it's very, it's a very um, a useful, uh, you know, touchstone. For, for us now and the and the republics or democracies are uh, once again uh, facing many of the um, deficiencies of democracy that Machiavelli sees uh, mm -hmm. with the emergence of sort of populist uh, demagogues um, yeah so I mean he he's you know in some sense very prescient there as well yeah no and I mean and he he, he uh, on the one hand, he is very much responsible in the history of thought for a shift towards democracies and saying, even if it's a, a, a principality, you are going to have to give much to the opinions of the people and figure out how, um, how to channel their desires. Um, so on the one hand, he's very much responsible for a shift towards democracy and away from aristocracies um, in whether he's talking about principalities or republics. On the other hand, he's also in some ways the father of constitutionalism. We're not quite there, but we're really getting there with, with him because he, he tries to come up in his Republican works with a way to sort of let loose popular passions, that's the democratic side. On the other hand, channeling them, channeling them in a way that are, that's non-destructive. It's sort of, you know, Federalist Papers 10 and 51, um, he, you know, in advance. Um, and uh, so, you know, the, the, the kind of populist um, pushing up against constitutional limits that's going on not just in the United States but around around the world right now um, is something he's very aware of he's kind of responsible for both sides of it you know or I mean responsible he's he's reflective of both sides of it the popular push but then also the guardrails that are supposed to be there he wants them both yeah I mean at at, at the uh, end of the book you talk a bit about how in many ways Machiavelli is uh, a, a a a founding father not not in the sense that he obviously was around for the declaration or or the constitution but that he really is the first one to articulate the notion of setting ambition against ambition to create a balance uh and that that that's very much a part of uh, as you were just adverting to in in um, federalist 10 and 51 um the, the notion of a, a republic resting on a, division of, of power and authority. Um, and, and so I think that's, uh, that's really important. Let me uh, just switch for a second to something, you know, you talked about the explosive nature of what Machiavelli was writing about, why these works were published after his, uh, after his death, um, uh, particularly the attack on Christianity. Um, famously, um, uh, Leo Strauss in his book, Thoughts on Machiavelli, says Machiavelli was a teacher of evil. And uh, Machiavellianism is synonymous with amorality in foreign policy, international affairs. You talked about realism. He's seen as one of the progenitors of realism in international affairs, in part because of the, um, the uh, his understanding that morality among people is different than morality among nations. But could you talk a little bit about that? I mean, is he a teacher of evil or is it a little more complicated than that? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's a lot more complicated than that. But, um, you know, it is a good place to start. And uh, you mentioned Leo Strauss and, and the first line of his book, Thoughts on Machiavelli, um, for years was quoted as, you know, being Strauss saying, asserting that Machiavelli was a teacher of evil. And then, you know, sort of uh, more liberal minded uh, folks seeing that as well, that's it's this very uh, moralistic condemnation of Machiavelli. And then Strauss is sort of written off as this moralist who's, who's writing off Machiavelli on moral grounds. 
that's you know, not a correct reading of Strauss to begin with, and then also not of, of Machiavelli with, with Strauss. I mean, his, the first line of his book is actually, we will not shock anyone. We will merely expose ourselves to good nature or at any rate, harmless ridicule if we profess ourselves inclined to the old fashioned and simple opinion according to which, and then we finally get the phrase, Machiavelli is a teacher of evil. <laughs> there are so many hedges before you get to Machiavelli as the teacher of evil um, that as you unpack those, and actually I do in, a, in an article in a book that uh, Jonathan Marks and I edited, um, in a chapter of that book, I, I give an interpretation of, of that introduction, Strauss's introduction um, to, uh, to thoughts on Machiavelli. Um, one, one recognizes that what Strauss is doing, I think, is the right thing to do. Um, he does say and thinks, but then says and turns the volume up even more than he really thinks, I think, um, all sorts of things that are, that are shocking from the point of view of, uh, you know, traditional morality and not just traditional morality, but morality as morality and religious belief, um, you don't want to get too fancy too fast and saying, oh, well, really, he's animated by, you know, wanting to get a job or he's animated by, um, you know, some realist doctrine that he has in his head and, um, and uh, or he has a republicanism that he's advocating and these bad moral things are really just in service to that. I mean, you got to just sort of follow your initial reactions, just kind of simple reactions. Yeah, you, when he talks about, you know, not caring about the death of your own parents as much as you, you know, care about getting their money when they die. Um, you know, uh, killing people, uh, you know, without a moment's reflection in order to gain power for yourself. He says and advocates all sorts of really um, shocking things. He implies that God is all but says God is a tyrant. If God were to exist as the Bible portrays him, shocking things. These are shocking. If if we weren't already so taken by Machiavelli's, the immoralism and then the subsequent toleration that he sort of initiated, we would be shocked. Um, so, you know, he says things that are very much at odds with, with morality and religion. And he does that with an eye to, to, you know, bringing them down and really bringing about a world very much like the one we live in, which is one where you can talk openly about and live your life in accordance with putting number one first. Um, and uh, uh, he wanted that not necessarily because, or, and not, I think, because he was evil and was in favor of evil. He wanted a world in which uh, a more reasonable life is possible in general for most people, but then also a world in which reason itself um, really can rule and reasoners at the highest level um, with himself as the <laughs> as the highest level um, philosophers can can do what they do um, at at the height and um, justify it in a different way from how it was justified in the past the life of a thinker can be justified as hey if you really understand the nature of the world you can succeed so pursue that but I think also, I mean, tell me if you disagree, but the, what Machiavelli implies in a lot of this is that, that at the level of statecraft, when you're talking about relations among nations, and particularly in war, that what appears to be moral at some level can have you know, very damaging consequences, and what appears to be immoral can actually potentially have very positive consequences. So just as an example, a modern example, uh, one I can imagine ha having read The Prince multiple times and having him, you know, reading Machiavelli talking about various actors, cruelty being an incredible virtue because it helped them end a war, that were he to write about Harry Truman's decision to use the atomic bomb to end the uh, World War II, he would see that as a virtuous action because it brought the war to a, an end as quickly as possible, thereby potentially saving millions of lives that would have been expended 
uh, in a uh, long drawn out invasion of the home islands. Is that a fair? Yeah. And even more, just to finish out that thought, yeah, even more, it would be justified by Machiavelli, not because it saved lives necessarily, though that would be a factor, but because the post-war situation is far, uh, far more controllable by the allied powers as a result of that kind of complete total surrender, which surrender leaves our forces still alive because ours would have, we would have been so uh, devastated by, you know, taking uh, Japan an island at a time uh, that the post-war situation would have been very different. Um, so, so yeah, he would, he would not hesitate uh, at advocating that, you know, now I don't, I don't think, uh, um, other ancient thinkers would hesitate either. I don't think Xenophon would hesitate. I don't think Plato would hesitate or Aristotle. Um, Augustine, Aquinas, yes, I think they would have. They'd need to. Just war theory um, makes it very hard to justify incinerating women and children in their bed, um, uh, even if you know you're at total war. So, so yeah, he does. But I'd also say, um, Eric, that that. That's clearest in the relationship between countries, as you're saying, but it's just as present within. And, and he's willing to, um, something we talked a little bit about before we started, he's willing to, to think through the immorality required in war and reason it back into the domestic sphere. Um, you know, so uh, what, what you need to do to prepare yourself for that international situation is have your own military but then what that does is it creates a danger within that that has to be as strong as the danger without that is to say you must have your own military um that own military then becomes a kind of threat uh internal to 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 your state and um he does not have any expectations of and doesn't presume upon the moral sensibilities of military leaders um, or citizenries uh, any more than he presumes upon moral action of state leaders against one another. Um, instead, he tries in a Republican context to set up a system of checks and balances where you have former military leaders kind of watching the current military leaders, knowing that those current military leaders are ambitious and their ambitious if, ambitions, if let go unchecked, is going to lead you to a situation where the military authorities are going to take over the political. And these, you know, watchful former commanders and maybe future commanders, it's not like Machiavelli is trying to cultivate. This, this is another actually big misunderstanding, a little sidebar here of Machiavelli. Um, there was the military stuff, but there's also this idea that he is uh, very much in favor of, of cultivating Republicanism that requires leaders and citizenry to be selflessly dedicated to the common good. It's just not accurate. Um, instead, he sets up a system wherein you have a bunch of self-interested <laughs> once and future military commanders being a check on the current and ambitious military commanders. He wants them all to be ambitious and keep each other in check and have this, this, um, their ambitions, uh, a former colleague of mine, fellow graduate student, Marcus Fisher, wrote a book, I think it was called um, Well-Ordered License. Uh, he does a good job of really developing this fully. Um, he want, you want to uh, direct outward the ambition that they all have within, not by making them selfless, but by having them fight each other. And the only way to keep them from fighting each other is conquer other people. Yeah, this, I mean, this, I think, was really the central uh, thrust of, of your book, which is what you call um, the prince's dilemma, which mm -hmm. is how to arrange the relationship between political authority and, and military power, what we today in our parlance would call civil military relations. Uh, mm -hmm. You've already talked a little bit about that, but do you, you want to maybe uh, for just a minute or two talk a little bit more about how that plays out in, in Machiavelli's writing. Yeah, I mean, it, it happens both in a Republican context, but you see it in its rawest form in a principality. Um, so uh, the, the basic dilemma 
that, you know, I mean, any reader of history kind of realizes, but Machiavelli really focuses on it and makes it central. Uh, the, the, the basic um, problem is if you're, if you're a political head of state, um, I mean, picture it as a principality, kingdom, um, you've got wars, you got to make sure you win them. Uh, if you have a military commander, your number one commander, uh, win a war for you, what's to keep that commander from overthrowing you? If that commander has the reputation that they often have as a result of the victory, um, how are you going to keep them from overthrowing you? Machiavelli says you can't. Um, if that commander is sufficiently ambitious, commander is going to turn on you and take over. Therefore, the only answer in a principality is don't let that situation arise. Be the commander yourself. You know, be Bismarck. Um, don't don't let someone else, uh, you know, or Frederick or whoever, you know, don't let someone else win for you. Win yourself. Um, and um, that and, and then if you're if you're the if you're the commander, as quickly as you can stage your coup, because you are a threat to the head of state. You must recognize you are. If you can do all you want to say, oh, I don't want to take over. I you know throw myself at your feet. Machiavelli says he's not going to believe you. Um, so take over now. And his best example of that is this, this wonderful character in this most charming book by Machiavelli, um, The Life of Castruccio Castracani of Luca, which Nathan Tarkoff and I are, are translating. We have a new translation of, of all of his literary works, and we're including that among them that'll, that'll come out in about a year and a half. Um, uh, he follows the life of Castruccio from being a, a mercenary to, to being the head of state and almost taking over Italy. Um, so either way, it's a dilemma republics then they have the same dilemma but it's just under the surface and then you know as i was describing you manage that dynamic through mutual fear um you you can't you kind of paper it over but it's always there and it's always bubbling under the surface and your only solution there is to somehow channel it to to direct it towards others um and uh, but it doesn't go away. And this is this is sort of at the core of that, you know, the, the moral, immoral question. Um, Machiavelli does not deal with the civil military relations issue um, either as the tradition did or as we do in a modern liberal democracy. Um, he recognizes this there and he kind of gives into this problem. We say, no, we have an oath that matters, an oath to the Constitution, and we have principles of our regime of um, individual rights and uh, freedom. Dedication to those does need to be a check on our military, and um, it's what Locke and later thinkers do to modify Machiavelli and establish modern liberal democracy instead of the kind of republics um, that just channel fear rather than establish principle and demand loyalty and, and, and uh, dedication to the Constitution. Well, Chris, I think we've um, managed to, in the time we've had here to both um, touch on what uh, Machiavelli um, wrote for his own time uh, when he was doing his job application to Lorenzo de' Medici, but also uh, what he addressed that is sort of timeless and which we continue, you know, to wrestle with, uh, today. So I really want to thank you for both, uh, the book, which is, you know, uh, really illuminating, um, and for joining us on Shield of the Republic today. Thanks so much for having me. It's really been a pleasure, Eric. And I am, I'm a big fan of your show. It's, uh, I'm glad to learn that it's on video now too. I, I missed that in the last few months. So, uh, uh, thanks for having me.